Hello everyone and welcome to lecture. Today's lecture will be on the multivariate chain rule and we're going to go through and essentially see how to generalize the chain rule from single variable calculus to multivariable calculus. And essentially this is going to answer the question of how do we differentiate or take the derivative of a multivariable composition of functions. because it turns out that when you start dealing with compositions of multivariable functions, you can run into very, very complicated chains of dependence or um, you know, the total dependence of one function on a number of other functions could be very, very, very complicated. So that the, the multivariable chain rule answers the question of how do we do this correctly? So we'll start by reviewing the, the simplest possible chain of functions which is just a single uh, dimensional chain. So you'll remember from your 1D calculus class that a 1D chain of functions or composition of functions is the simplest possible chain. So let's suppose we have that w is the output of one function, which is a function of some variable u. And we'll also suppose that u is equal to some other function g of x. So we visualize this dependency, this chain of dependence, using what's called a tree diagram. Right, this tree diagram kind of gives us a visual uh, aid in looking at this chain of dependence. Specifically, the tree diagram for this scenario is going to look like the following. You're going to have that W depends on U. So we draw a line from W to U. And then U depends on X. And we label the edges of the tree diagram with exactly how the top variable or the variable above depends on the variable variable immediately below it. Specifically, the rate of change of w with respect to x is going to be the derivative of the function f with respect to u. Or f prime of u. And similarly, the, uh, the, the rate of change of u with respect to x is going to also be written on this label right here, because this line represents that u depends on x. The rate of change of u with respect to x, or g prime of x, is what this line is, gets labeled as. And so we know then that if you want to figure out the rate of change of w with respect to x, the top variable with respect to the bottom, bottom variable, or dw dx, 
that amounts to taking the x derivative of the composition f of g of x which in your single variable calculus class you hopefully saw this is calculated directly using the chain rule it's the derivative of f at g of x multiplied by the derivative of the inner function g of x the g prime of x And this is the chain rule. This is how we take the derivative along a chain of dependence like this. So this is the same thing as, you can write it in slightly nicer, shorter notation as just df du, or the derivative of the function f with respect to u times du dx the derivative of u with respect to x. So either of these two notations are, are fine to write. Be careful you don't confuse this though. This isn't there's nothing algebraic at this about this expression right here. This is specifically just stating that uh, the the u derivative of f times the u or the x derivative of u is in fact equal to the derivative of the upper variable with respect to x. But this, this notation is going to be helpful to us um, uh, in terms of you know, when we go to multivariable functions because it's going to help us um, sort of uh, simplify in some sense and uh, write down the, the chain rule for more complicated compositions in a nicer manner. Just see one example of this. Hopefully you, you, you'll remember um, from a, a calculus, calculus 1 class let's say that f of u is equal to sine of u and u is equal to x cubed so the composition all right so this is our g of u or g of x so w is in fact equal to the composition f of g of x or sine of x cubed. And if you want to figure out the derivative of w with respect to x, you can do so using the chain rule, which is going to be the derivative of f at g of x times the derivative of g so dw dx is going to be equal to the derivative of sine which is cosine at g of x so it's at x cubed times the derivative of g which is going to be 3 x squared from the power rule so this is the correct way of using the, the single variable chain rule. So this is what we'll, we'll, we'll be generalizing in this lecture to many different complicated scenarios and we'll also see how, to, how this applies in uh, certain real-world examples. So the, the next possible, you know, let's say the, the next possible, you know, simplest case that we consider is if you have uh, the w is equal to a multivariable function of a certain number of variables and each one of those variables depends on a single value so each one of those variables is a single function so we'll say that the, the next simplest case is a multivariable function of n variables where each of the variables
is a single variable function. So we'll consider what this looks like for functions of two variables and three variables. But the idea is that this extends uh, in general for uh, any number of variables as well. So in the 2D case, we have that W, say, the output. Is a function of two variables where each of the inputs to w is itself a function of some, let's say, some value t, some uh, single variable t. So x equals some function of t, and y is also some function of t. So the, the tree diagram for this scenario is given by the following. We have at the top, w is the final output of this function. But because w is a multivariable function, it itself depends on two things. It depends on x and y. And each one of these values, x and y, also depend on t. So you see that the chain of dependence or the tree diagram for this scenario is a little bit more complicated. <clears throat> because if you ask how does w depend on t, or what is the, the rate of change of w with respect to t, you'll notice that there are two separate ways that w depends on t. If you change t by a small amount, x is going to change, and therefore w is going to change. But if you change t by a small amount, then y is also going to change, which means w is going to change. So there's actually two separate uh, pieces here to this chain that we have to factor in when we look for the full rate of change of w with respect to t. So just like before, we can label the tree diagram, and we label it with, it'll be now the partial derivatives. So the w depends on x through the partial derivative of the function f with respect to x. This is the rate of change of w with respect to x. w depends on y with respect to you know, the total amount of that rate of change of w with respect to y is the partial derivative of f with respect to y. And likewise, we have here that x depends on t. So uh, the, this, this edge right here is going to be labeled as the derivative of x with respect to t. And y also depends on t. So this edge right here is going to be labeled as dy dt. And you'll notice that <clears throat> in order to calculate the full rate of change of w with respect to t, we have to factor in both of these paths right here. Because any change in t will result in a change in w through both these paths. And this is the first time that we'll see the, the full multivariable chain rule. So the, you can we can go through and show that um, the, the total rate of change of w with respect to t is actually going to be the sum of the normal derivative along each one of these chains of dependence, or each one of these single single uh, variable change, single dimensional chains. So the rate of change along this path will be calculated using the single variable derivative. It's just df dx times dx dt. And we have to add to that df dy times dy dt. And there, there you have it. This is how you do the, 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 
the ch multivariable chain rule for this tree diagram, this chain of dependence. In, in general, this is going to be how we always go through and do the, the multivariable chain rule. Now, it's interesting to note here that this has actually um, a lot of geometric significance, and we'll see that if we introduce the dot product between vectors. So this expression right here is the same thing as dw dy dw dx comma dw dy dot product with the vector x prime y prime. You'll remember from a previous calc course that the, the dot product between vectors, if I have a vector a, and a vector b, the dot product between vectors, a dot b, is just the sum of the multiplication of each individual component. So a1b1 plus a2b2. That's how you do it for a vector with two components. But this vector isn't just any special, any, any old vector. It's a very special vector. What we've shown is that dwdt is the gradient vector, or this is the gradient vector, and it's the vector dot product with this x prime y prime, which is sometimes called the velocity vector along a given curve. So what we've stumbled upon, and this also holds in 3D as well, I'll go over how this, this is in 3D in one second, but if we kind of graph out here what's going on, this is the x-axis, the y-axis, and we have some function, f of x, y with level curves, say maybe the level curves look like this. So if you look at r of t is x of t let me say x is a function of t and y is a function of t you have an expression for what's called a parametric curve. You should see this, you should remember this hopefully from a previous calculus course. So whenever you have the, the x coordinate and the y coordinate is our function of a single parameter, you have a parametric curve that's um, essentially giving you a point on a curve at a whole bunch of different points at any given t value you might choose. So what we've just figured out using the multivariable chain rule is how to take the, the derivative along a curve. It's saying that the derivative or the rate of change of any function along a curve is the gradient of that function dot product with the velocity vector along the curve. The velocity vector v is always tangent to the curve at any given point. So if f, say, is a temperature function, then this quantity that you calculate is the rate of change of temperature along a curve as you're traveling in a certain velocity. So this also works in 3D as well. This Even the, the curve interpretation works in 3D, uh, which is very cool. So in, in 3D, this is the scenario where W, the output, is a function of three variables. And each component, X, Y, and Z, are all function of a single variable that we'll call T.
the tree diagram for this scenario gives us that W depends on X, Y, and Z. And each of these values, X, Y, and Z, all depend on T. So from the multivariable chain rule, if you want to figure out dw dt, this is going to be the partial derivative of w with respect to x times dx dt plus the partial derivative of w with respect to y times dy dt plus the partial derivative of w with respect to z times dz dt, which is the same thing just like before as the gradient vector of the function f and then dot product with the vector v, where this is uh, the velocity vector of a curve in 3D. So again, if you have some path, say, some particle maybe that's moving along this path that you call r of t, the velocity vector of this curve is always going to be tangent to the curve. And the derivative of r of t. And we're seeing that we just showed that the, the from the chain rule, the multivariable chain rule, the rate of change of w along the curve is the gradient of the function f dotted with the velocity vector. This is a really cool, cool uh, thing here that we were kind of discovering that this allows us to really uh, accurately describe uh, the rate of change of functions along curves and we'll actually see that this also allows us to describe the rate of change of multivariable functions on surfaces or with any, any possible geometric um, object that we might want to consider the rate of change of a function on. Remember that this was calculated directly, you know, using single variable chains because along each of these, uh, these branches, right, this branch right here, the rate of change represents the rate of change of w with respect to x. This middle branch represents the rate of change of w with respect to y. This branch right here represents the rate of change of w with respect to z. And this branch represents dx dt. This branch represents dy dt. And this branch represents dz dt. So we'll look at a specific example in 2D to kind of see how, how we can uh, go through and do these calculations uh, and use, use what we've just shown. So let's see an example of this in action. What we'll do is consider the problem of solving for the rate of change Sometimes we'll just abbreviate this by ROC of the temperature function where W is the temperature We'll say that w is given by the function x squared minus y squared. Along the curve, the 
generated by an ellipse. Or an elliptical level level curve. So we'll use a specific ellipse. We'll use uh, the ellipse with the semi-major axis along the x-axis of length 2 and uh, the semi-minor axis along the y-axis of length 1. So this is the, the algebraic equation of an ellipse with those parameters. And specifically, we'll look at this uh, at a specific point. We'll say, look at the rate of change of temperature along the curve generated by an ellipse. at the point r naught is equal to 2 over the square root of 2 for the x component and 1 over the square root of 2 for the y component using the standard parameterization of the ellipse. So first things first, let's kind of get a picture of uh, what, what this looks like. And uh, also recall, remember the, the standard parameterization of the ellipse. So um, just, just like the circle, for any ellipse, right, the equation is going to be x over a squared plus y over b squared is equal to 1. This is an ellipse that stretches along the x-axis at length 2a and the y-axis of a length 2b. And for any ellipse, we can parameterize that ellipse by the following. We say that x of t is equal to a times cosine of t and y of t is equal to b times sine of t for t between 0 and 2 pi where t is representing the angle that we were looking at so this is the the standard way of parameterizing an ellipse and this is what we mean by the standard parameterization of the ellipse so we want to figure out at this exact point on the ellipse what exactly the rate of change of the function x squared minus y squared is along the ellipse. So we also want to get an idea of what um, this is looking like when we try and get a picture of this function. And we can do this uh, very, very nicely using the level curves of this function. So we have an x-axis here, a y-axis. You'll remember that the level curves of this function, uh, the function x squared minus y squared, look like the following curves. When the function is equal to 0, you get two straight lines, y equals x and y equals negative x, for the level curves of the function. This corresponds to w is fixed at 0. And then for other values of the function, you get hyperbolas. So say when uh, w is equal to the fixed value of positive 1, say, you get a hyperbola that maybe intersects. I'm going to do two intersections right here and right here as well for negative 1. So when w is equal to positive 1, you get a hyperbola that looks like this right here. This corresponds to a fixed value of w is equal to 1. You also have a hyperbola Oops, goes right here as well.
corresponds to w is equal to 1. And when w is equal to 2, you get a similar I'll just say, actually, we'll call this one though when w is equal to 4. Same thing here as well. And then as w increases, you get uh, hyperbolas that are further and further and further out. And you get the same sort of picture when you have consider negative values of w when w is negative. I'll do the negative values of w as a dotted dotted line right here for this hyperbola. And this corresponds to w is equal to negative 1. Same thing right here. So this value corresponds to W equals negative four. So there you have it. This is what the level curves of this function look like. And then along the ellipse of semi-major axis, along x of distance uh, 2, and semi-minor axis of distance 1, this right here is exactly that curve. This is the curve C that we're looking for the rate of change of the function along. And uh, specifically, right, you can actually do this for any point, but we're looking directly uh, for the rate of change of this function at the point uh, 2 over square root of 2, 1 over square root of 2, which is definitely a point on this ellipse. So it's going to be at uh, an angle of 3 pi over 4. So this is the specific point that we're looking at. This is our value R naught. So what we're looking for is the rate of change of the function with respect to the standard parameterization tangent to the curve right here at this point. So we have our parameterization. We have x of t, y of t, and we also have a chain of dependence or a tree diagram that directly describes uh, everything we need to know to take this partial derivative. Or actually, it's a total derivative. Specifically, the temperature w is a function of x and y. And on the ellipse, uh, so when you're kind of going around the ellipse in this parameterization, x and y also depend on t, the parameter of the curve. So that tells us that from the, the, the multivariable chain rule, the rate of change of temperature with respect to the parameter t is going to be equal to the sum of df partial f partial x times dx dt, or x prime, plus partial f partial y times y prime. Because this term is the rate of change of f with respect to y this term is the rate of change of y with respect to t. And 
and the idea is that uh, we're really only gonna we're really only trying to evaluate this at uh, one fixed point at the point R naught. Right, so we'll make make a point to write that down. We're going to be essentially evaluating this entire thing at the point R naught, at one fixed point. Same thing right here. So we got to figure out what this is at the point of evaluation. Now what we're going to, this process that we're doing holds for any point on this curve, but we're really uh, in this problem only just looking at one fixed point. But before we plug into that point, we want to go through and do our calculations. So dfdx at r0, uh, if f is the function f of xy, remember, is x squared minus y squared, df dx is the derivative of that with respect to x, the partial derivative. So it'll be 2x evaluated at r0. It's be multiplied by x prime. And remember, so this is our general parameterization for the ellipse. Uh, this curve C, right, our blue curve right here, is the ellipse with a equals 2 and b equals 1. So it's x of t is equal to two times cosine t and y of t is equal to just sine of t. So that means that x prime, or the derivative of x of t, is going to be negative 2 times sine of t. Again, this is evaluated at that point, r naught, plus df dy, which is negative 2y, evaluated at the point r0, times the derivative of sine of t, y prime, which is going to be cosine of t, at r0. And you could go through and show directly that, that this angle, right, this angle T at this point right here is, so T at that point, or T naught, is equal to 3 pi over 4. It's going to change depending on what point you choose. Um, so you could just plug in 3 pi over 4 here for T and, and be done with it. But uh, I'll show you how you can also do the following. You can um, use the fact that um, for any value on the curve, x is equal to 2 cosine of t. So cosine of t is the same thing as x over 2 for points on the curve for any angle on this ellipse. And same thing because y is equal to sine of t. Well, that means that whenever you see a sine of t, you can replace it with the, the y value for the point on the ellipse, which is nice. And what you end up getting here when you plug in is you're going to have 2 times x, and the point x at r0 is 2 over the square root of 2. So it's going to be this. Times negative 2 times sine of t, which is negative 2 times 1 over the square root of 2, because sine of t is just equal to y on this ellipse. This is going to be plus negative 2 times y, which is 1 over the square root of 2, times cosine of t, which is x over 2. So this x over 2 is 2 over the square root of 2 over 2. And we can simplify this uh, a lot. Specifically, um, you have here 2 over the square root of 2. Uh, you have this 
two right here over two, so these two these two twos cancel out. Um, you're gonna end up getting. A ne uh, and I, I think I missed. There should be a negative sign right here because this is the x coordinate. We should also have a negative sign right here as well because that was our, our x coordinate. So this entire thing simplifies to four. The negative signs cancel one another. It's four times square root of two times one over the square root of two plus this is going to be uh, two over the square root of two is just the square root of two times one over the square root of two So the square root of twos cancel out in both cases, and you're left with just four plus one, or five. So this is telling us that this is the rate of change of the temperature function, the specific temperature function at this point uh, with respect to the standard parameterization of the ellipse. So if you're moving around the ellipse, say, uh, according to the standard parameterization, um, this is what you feel in terms of the temperature. You're seeing that it depends both on the speed at which you go around the ellipse and the, the, the function itself. Um, so the units of this would be, say, if you're measuring in degrees Fahrenheit, the units would be degrees Fahrenheit uh, per, per second, say, if, if T is a, a time in terms of seconds. But, um, you know, the units could depend on what the... The, the problem and what, what units of measuring you're using to measure your answer. Now you'll notice that this actually makes a lot of sense if you look at the, the actual uh, point itself, right? If you look in the direction tangent to the curve going around the ellipse in this direction with respect to the x-axis, you see that in that direction, uh, the function's moving up. Your, your level curves are increasing, so you expect to get a positive value for your rate of change. Um, and this is directly matching, so this is directly matching uh, exactly what you would expect from this plot of the level curves of the function. Um, the level curves aren't gonna give you the exact value of the rate of change at any point. You can only do that using this exact, you know, the exact computational method but the level curves can help you verify your result to sort of check your work and make sure you're doing everything, um, you know, what, what, what the, the, the picture of what the function should be doing is matching up with uh, what you're doing in terms of your calculations. And so just like with uh, essentially everything else that we uh, want to look at in this course, uh, it really helps to have multiple different visualizations of the concept that we're looking at. Um, so the first visualization that I'll show is a GeoGebra applet that I made um, that uh, you can alter and I'll, you know, I'll post on Canvas so you can use it to kind of investigate uh, problems like this um, that might arise in your homework or uh, other areas. Um, and the idea here is the following. So. Um, the, the green surface here is a surface plot of uh, the function x squared minus y squared, which is the function that we're investigating, and um, I restricted it to only plot the surface inside the, the curve. Really, uh, the function is defined everywhere, but uh, we, we can get a visualization of this as well if we want to see this. Um, so here I've drawn uh, the, the curve that we're considering. And if I rotate this a little bit, you can see um, the plot of the function right here, uh, along with the value of the function uh, on uh, each individual point on this curve right here. So this is our ellipse. And um, I'll uh, change the angle to be correspond to 2 pi over 3, which is exactly this point right here. Oops, so we want to rotate our axis a little bit here 
And here we are. The positive x-axis is going this way, positive y-axis is going this way, and the z-axis is right here. And we see we're right at the angle of uh, 2 pi over 3 the, uh, with respect to the z-axis from the x-y uh, in the x-y plane. And sure enough, um, so the, the slope of uh, this curve right here, which is the value of the function on the boundary, is exactly giving us the rate of change of this function along the curve at this point. So the, the value that we just calculated, 5, is uh, the rate of change of this function. And if you want to see, or you can kind of change uh, as we go around our curve and see how uh, this value changes. Uh, but this is a nice visualization, I think, uh, showing uh, directly you know, what this value represents, the, the rate of change of this function along the curve. Um, and uh, if you want, we can kind of put the entire function here to kind of show uh, exactly what's going on and what value we just calculated. So this is a pretty neat uh, idea and a very neat application of the multivariable chain rule. And like I said before, you know, as always, it helps to have multiple different visualizations here. So if we now switch over to uh, a density plot, uh, so I'm going to plot the density of this function, just in 2D, the level curves of this function. And I'm going to plot the gradient field of this function. We'll really see uh, uh, a, a firm uh, confirmation of what we've just done. So I just opened up my Python code here. And uh, what I'm going to do is run the code that I've written uh, to, to visualize uh, what we're talking about. And we see here a plot of the level curves of this function, um, as well as the curve that we're considering uh, the rate of change on. We want to find the rate of change on. And uh, I've uh, colored the curve with a separate color, ball, color bar here. Uh, the changing in the function is uh, from negative 4 to 4 here over the entire region. And uh, this color bar just corresponds to the value of the function on uh, the curve at each uh, given point. Uh, but we see very clearly that as we're moving here uh, in this direction at this point, we expect uh, a positive rate of change. Um, and uh, this is because, i got to zoom in here, the value of the function is increasing as we move in this direction. So this green vector right here is the tangent vector to this curve at this point, and the black vector is the gradient vector of the function at this point. Um, and we showed that the uh, uh, directional, well, this actually ends up being the directional derivative uh, along the curve in some sense. Uh, at this point. We haven't defined it yet, but we will define that uh, a little bit later on. Um, but this is exactly the dot product of the tangent vector to the curve right here, which depends on the velocity of along the curve with the gradient vector at this point right here. So this is very, very cool. And it's clear that if we change uh, the point on this curve that we're evaluating, the rate of change of this function along uh, this curve, uh, we're going to get a, a different value for uh, this rate of change. So here I've just changed the point that I'm uh, evaluating, I'm looking at, and you see that here uh, the tangent of the curve is in this direction, the velocity vector is in this direction, but the gradient is in this direction, and sure enough uh, we end up getting uh, a, a negative value for the rate of change because the function is decreasing uh, in this direction, the direction of this green arrow, um, at the, at this point. 